Thank you so much for being on board in Transatlantic. You My are God. a legendary ocean. I couldn't miss this one, so I'm so excited today. Uh, it's my, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Look, as we say, like, everybody's an ocean. Everybody's an ocean of erratic thoughts and wild feelings. And to really get to know someone, you need to cross the ocean. So we are here today to cross your ocean through the Seven Seas interview. And hopefully we can give people, our audience, back in Europe in Italy and across the Straits, a side of you that many don't know. I would say, let's go right into it, first question, and let's okay. see this beautiful ocean. <laughs> let's do it. Okay, the ocean of Paolo Coelho, one of the most prolific Brazilian writers, lives inside a man. He has no borders, but his own soul. There is a quote from Paolo that goes, I have inside me the winds, the deserts, the oceans, the stars, and everything created in the universe. We were all made by the same hand, and we have the same soul. Now, if you were to choose a natural element that truly embodies your spirit, what would that be? The wind. The wind, right. Yeah, and I think because it's funny because it's it's a it's a visceral re, visceral reaction. So, all right, that's it. Let me let me try to to explain why that. I mean, I I was born in Brazil, moved to California 15 years ago, and then I it's and I remember kind of getting like at some point I I got an award there as like a a um, as one of the, the key people in the industry in, in California, in the advertising business in, in, in California. And so that was great, but that was, it was funny how that particular moment made me think about how much of a local I became. Mm. And I don't like to be a local. Mm. I like to be the, stra the outsider, I like to be the stranger. Um, and I think that's why I moved uh, from Brazil to to California before, then why I moved from California to to New York later. That is actually not completely New York. I live right outside, so it's like my life has always been the life of being outsider. I started my career as a programmer, then I got into into advertising because I felt like there was a, an overlap between technology and and advertising. I spent my entire career, most of it like being that guy that didn't belong and people say, what are you asking? What are you doing here? You're not a writer, not an art director, you're what? And, and, and I think that if you, if, if you have to describe in terms of nature is more, for me, it's like that wind that keeps knocking on, on your window and it keeps doing, it keeps hitting your window and your doors and, and you feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna let it get in. And eventually it's gonna, find a little sliver and when you realize it's all inside of your house and I, I I'm always on the move I'm always the outsider but I'm also um, very insistent on the things that I want and the things that I, I dream and I, what I think it should be so I, I'll keep finding try to find a little crack to get in and, and that's how I've been operating my entire life that is awesome, man. I, I love the wind. You know, it reminds me, I, I lived in San Francisco for a while, moved to California as well. And uh, for a couple of years, I lived in Marine and I crossed the Golden Gates every single day for two years straight with my motorcycle. And that was 14 years of my life was that, kind of crossing <laughs> the Golden Gates and seeing the wind, the, the, seeing the, the, the fog just crossing the exactly. bridge. Exactly. Right? And, and like you, when you ride a motorcycle, you are so into the elements and the, the wind is so strong. And usually it pickups up at 5 p.m. and it goes like through the night and like that experience. Now where you were mentioning the wind and be with the elements, something that you can, it's, it's strange because you can't touch, but you can feel. So it's tangible and intangible at the same time. It's a great answer. It's a really great metaphor, man. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Second question. The ocean floor is considered the last true frontier on the planet. Scientists have described the extraction of mineral wealth 
from the deep ocean as perhaps the greatest challenge of the 21st century. Now, sometimes it happens to me that I look at advertising business as the last frontiers of capitalism. The extraction of the creative work from the ocean floor of our industry is a great challenge. How do you stay creative, fresh, and relevant within an industry that too often try to homologate and squash the uniqueness of our creativity? Uh, I, mean, I think that the, the problem goes even beyond my concern and, and with, with the industry goes beyond the, the squashing the creativity. Because I think that, that if the world, the world has always contributed, always tried to squash creativity because that's, that's the norm, right? If you're, if you're trying to do anything slightly different from everyone else, everyone else is going to, are going to try to come to, to make you stop. I remember when, when I went to college, I went to business school and I like to, to write and to draw and to paint. My, my classmates would tell me why, would ask me, so why, why, why would you do it? It doesn't, it, it doesn't create any value. That was their, their exact words. You should stop doing that and put, put your time on something that creates value. And if I had listened to them, I would have kind of thrown away two thirds of my brain. I would have been unhappy and wouldn't have done any of the things that I have done. So I think that the, 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 the challenge of the, the creative spirit is going to be there no matter what. It's like, it could be, it's a challenge of, of it's a timeless challenge. I think that the challenge that we have right now with the, the, with capitalism and the way that the world is and, and how we are running out of resources and, and everything is being overly done. I think it's a, it's a, is a matter of, of understanding of, of developing a bigger understanding of our footprint. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, every industry in the world is aware now, we're all, almost all of them is aware of what is the, their, their environmental footprint. So if you, um, if you, if you extract coal, you know that you're creating air pollution. If you uh, make um, automobiles, you know that there's a, an impact in the mining that it takes, the energy that it takes to build the cars, and you, you're, the cars you're building are going to use uh, gas, so you need to see if it can, so if it can move to electric. So there's every, every industry, in some way, if you, if you make clothes, you're, you're now worried about, you're being challenged to, to worry about the, the amount of paint that you put in the water and how you purify the water that you're putting back into the environment. So everyone is being challenged by the, 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 the footprint that they, 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 they leave behind them. The ad industry, because we don't, we don't take a physical thing and put something back in the, in the, in the world in a physical form, because our, our job is, is around ideas, we tend to believe that we have no footprint. But we do. It's just that our footprint is cultural. I remember once a, a few years ago, I had the, the opportunity to, for kind of a crazy combination of events, I had a, the chance to be, to interview Bill Clinton on stage at Cannes, which was a whole weird story altogether because I don't hear from one side and, and Secret Service put him right next to my, 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 my deaf ear so I couldn't hear everything. So, but it went well, thankfully, but it could have been a disaster. But I remember one of my questions, and one of the few ones that, that I, I could listen, was I asked him, so what is what we have here when you look around us? We have 10,000 people watching you live. And these people, if you, if you think about the money, the size of the voice that they represent, and how strong, if we combine all our voices together, all the, 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 the loudness of what we say, together it mean it, it's it may be the, the loudest voice in the planet so what do you think that we should be worried about and in my head I was like he's going to talk about climate change or social injustice or it's been more than 10 years right I, yeah probably about 10 years 
and, and of like, it's going to be social injustice or, or climate change. And I was kind of waiting for him to talk about one cause. And he said, I think you should worry about the impact of the words you put out. Yeah. And it's such a simple answer, but it, 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 it changed the meaning of, of, of the job for me. And in, and after that, a couple of years later, kind of the whole thing about like, let's find purpose and everything started to, I started to look at that like, yeah, we are looking for purpose, external purpose and try to find way to squeeze making the world better inside of what we do, which there's nothing wrong with it, but it's a slightly unnatural um, way of, of looking deep and finding the real thing that is that footprint. Every time you put a message, every time you write something you put in the world, whether if it's a movie or if it's a book or if it's an ad, there's a story you're telling and people are taking stuff, taking thoughts from that story that changes them. How are we changing people? Are we changing them to make them angrier about, them, uh, about each other? Are we changing them to be kinder to each other? Are we changing them to make the world a better place? And I'm telling you this because there's lots of things that we, for ages, we took as the, the gospel in our industry. And now looking back, if you look with the, the distance that the perspective of age gives you, I wonder if that, that wasn't a mistake. I mean, I'm, I'm 47 now. I've been in this industry since, uh, since 22. So there are a lot of years uh, behind. And I remember one of the, the few things that remain constant through this, my, my entire time in advertising is, that, is the idea that you need to pick a side. You need to, the, the best way to, to deliver a powerful message is to find something that will really appeal to a group, even if it, if, if gets some other group, another group angry. And I took that as, oh yeah, that's our job, to make some people happy and make some other, other people angry because then the people that love you will really love you, really love your brand, really love your message. But then you look back at the footprint and when you think about that done through decades and collectively by every single person and every single brand that works in this industry and every single member of our audience that heard brands talking about things that make them different from each other. We create a society that takes pride on being different, which I always thought it was a cool thing, but the footprint of that, the pollution of our message is that people started to, to think of, of the, the similarities as a bad, as the, the opposite of, of our differences. Therefore, what makes, you a bad person what makes it worse so when the moment we celebrate differences for decades and and laugh of of all the similarities i think we are actually collectively one message at a time 30 seconds one second or 30 seconds at a time one headline at a time we are putting a message out there that now we are, our, our kids, the next generation is gonna be the one paying for that. The same way that a coal miner needs to be thinking about the pollution that they are putting in the air, we, think of, we need to think about the pollution we're putting on people's minds and spirits. And that pollution, I think, is divisiveness. Not that my last spot was responsible for all the divisive, divisiveness in the world. There's politics that can take a lot of that as well. But I think that we, all the cultural industry, including entertainment, including news, and including the marketing world, we have to take responsibility for creating this pollution, this cultural pollution that is divisiveness. It's part of our responsibility. We cause that. No, I, I, lo I love this answer. I mean, thank you so much for the explanation. And You know, when were you talking about footprint, I could envision this. And it, it works double way for me, you know, because I think like personally, I, I, I came into the advertising world, like uh, I got the advertising bug when I was a little kid because of the footprint that were left. Uh, some of the commercial, the stories that I love the most come from like the were words that they put out there, right? The Vice commercial was a beautiful footprint for me. At the same time, I do agree that so we need to be, 
aware of the power of the words and treat them as tangible things that once they are put out there, they can do damage or they can pollute and they can truly uh, asphyxiate uh, creativity. And like, you know, they are very useful for like new generation. And so I think like your answer articulate these concepts very well because it's my fear, it's my, it's what people call leg legacy. Legacy is a beautiful word, but it's a giant bucket. And it's filled with footprints. That's what I think, right? So it's like, I think we need to be careful like what kind of footprint we put inside the giant bucket of legacy to leave something behind that like is useful, it has a purpose. And it's a challenge to do it, but uh, you are one of them. You are one of those guys that are trying to do with a conscious uh, choice of like, you know, creativity. So that's why like, I thought across the ocean was amazing. And, and, and listen, I mean, the, the problem with looking at, with, at what you're doing from a, a legacy or a footprint standpoint is that it's very easy to, to think, to feel that you're, what you're doing is right and is good because no one produces poison on purpose. The, the negative footprint that you leave is often invisible. It's usually so small that you think that it's irrelevant. But when you accumulate through decades and through a vast territory and everyone is doing the same, you have like climate change or climate crisis because of that. It's like a little bit of pollution. They're like, yeah, my pollution is not causing anything. It's not, it's not that bad. But everyone through decades creates that problem that now our kids are going to have to solve. And I think that's the same thing. There's some beautiful ideas that are put out in the world, but behind all those beautiful ideas, we also seeded a thought that is insidious because it's so small that you don't notice. Right. That is this value that what makes you special is what make, are the things that makes you, is your difference. And if what makes you special is your difference, you don't want to be like anyone else. Absolutely. And if we don't want to be like anyone else, we are stuck into this shithole that we are right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Uniqueness is the only uh, exit we have. You know, I, I remember, I always I like to remind people like, you know, the Oscar Wilde quotes, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And it's like, it's a beautiful quote because like it really shows you that there is no other way out that like push the accelerator on uniqueness. So no, listen, we have to find a way to balance that being myself and no one else, but also finding the things that make us the same. You know, that is, that is the trick. If we all only recognize ourselves for our uniqueness, the, the, the sameness loses value. And, and I think when, when it, the sameness loses value, we, we break the, the, the social fabric mm -hmm. of, of our communities. We break the, the, the bonds that, that connect us. We need to be able to see what makes us different, but also what makes us the same. We are, right now, the world is 100% focused on what makes us different. And it cannot be different if we're all different then there's nothing left. Then we are like that, that guy on, on, on the, that, that Twilight Zone episode that wakes up at the end of the world. He w wanted to be, he wants to be left alone. He wakes up and the world has ended and is great and everything. And then his, bla his glasses bro breaks and- No, I do agree. I do agree. The uniqueness has to happen within a certain like paradigm uh, within society. So, I do completely agree on that. The Oscar Wilde quote, it was a very human uh, quote, uh, discouraging like those who were trying to mock or imitate other people, try to find your own personality, your own voice. So I do think that once you find your own voice within the paradigm of society, then you can find the right balance. But yeah. uniqueness is the first step because you live in a society and you had to find your own voice. Anyway, this is a great conversation. <laughs> I got the third question that you may have already answered a little bit, but let's go. In 2,500, 
as a result of the sea levels rising over 25,000 feet, every continent on Earth is underwater. The remains of human civilizations live on a ramshackle floating communities known as atolls. Now, this is not my imagination, like just firing shots at you, but it's actually the creative plot behind the movie Waterworld. It's a 1995 American post-apocalyptic film that was directed by Kevin Reynolds. If you were to imagine the state of advertising in 2,500, what scenarios comes in mind? If, if, you, if you were at a world, if you're part of, of a world that it's at war with everyone, and that everyone is a threat, with, that kind of brings me the, the sadness of, of, our, of, of our business. Hmm. If we look at, at the, the, in the short term, because we are a form of cultural agent that works for hire by brands that need to create a result or companies that need to create results for the next quarter, the next year, there is very little accountability for that, that kind of long-term issue. So I would say that that probably advertising a water world situation would be uh, about what makes each small community themselves and what makes them different from the other ones and how the other ones would probably hate this product and why this is just for you, which would only increase the, the, the distance and the, the, the differences between the groups. Of course, there will be someone out there that are going to do a campaign that will try to unite all the communities so they can win an award that, uh, somewhere. But it's not going to. It wasn't going to be the the way that things uh, operate in in the day by day. You know, it's like funny because uh, I tried to answer this question when I was writing it, and my wish is more than an answer. My wish is it goes along with a story uh, that was written by Philip Dick in like Do Android Sleep of a uh, Dream of Electric Ship. And there's a futuristic scenario where everybody's connected to an empathy box to feel something, to have emotion, because humankind has run out of emotions. And I think like if I imagine like advertising 2,500 to me, I wish that each of us in this industry could be connected to an empathy box because what I've been seeing is like, the emotions are drying and the numbers are in and the empathy is getting lower and lower and lower and the risk is truly like to forget that kind of empathy level and disconnect completely and sometimes we see this happening and so when philip dick say one day humankind will need an empathy box each of us and be connected to it like a portable empathy box, like a mobile phone, I do believe that. That could be one potential scenario. I don't know, might be crazy, but like, you know, that's what I feel personally. But I have hope that, that the industry, the people in the industry are waking up. They want to, mostly want to do the, the, the right things. I don't think that, that we are an in industry right now when I look around me and I look at, at that my peers and my friends in the business, I don't think there's anyone there that is not aware of the problems of the world, is not trying to make a difference in some shape or form. Um, I have been way more cynical about this business in the past. I think that, that people that in 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it was more of a battle between people that wanted to do the right thing, use the power of our voice to do the right things, against people that just wanted to get the numbers up to, to the, the end of the cycle to, to mm. work to get their bonus. I see between the, the advertising people, the marketing people and the client side and everything, I feel like there is a more genuine um, intention to do, to do things right, to, to honor the, um, the power that we have and that we, we inherited or we're being given. But I think that that, that level of awareness needs to evolve into, into the more subtle 
um, elements of what we do, and and not only f by by embracing big causes, but really thinking through the the impact of our words beyond the test that we have at hand. Absolutely. You know, not, if, otherwise, just doing a cause, doing cause marketing uh, to to sell a soda or a beer or a car could could become very easily can can become the equivalent of buying trees in the amazon to compensate for your uh, the 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 amount of co2 that you've put out on your factories right it's not it's just comp trying to balance for the amount of bad stuff you put out in the world not really solving the problem i think Absolutely. you're going to solve the problem when you look at you look deep into you know what is the pro what are we doing with our products and more than anything what are we doing with our messages and the impact of the social responsibility of, of the message we're putting out, the, the world would be much better if we just start to look into these more subtle, subtle elements of what we do. I wish I was there in 2500, man. <laughs> and I, it will be, you know, if, I, I'm not a good swimmer, so I'm not, I don't want to be there. <laughs> okay, look, uh, this is about Jiu Jitsu. I know you are like a master of martial arts and uh, I've been waiting actually to ask you this question because uh, you and I are two immigrants and you and I are both in love with like uh, two combat fights. I'm like, I've been boxing for a few years. So mm -hmm. you are like a true martial artist. So he has the question. The following statement is birthed by a true story. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu came out of an ocean crossing. It was first developed in the 1920s by Brazilian brothers after one of the brothers, Carlos Gracie, I don't know if I pronounced correctly, uh, was taught traditional Kodokan Judo by a Japanese judoka, Mitsuyo Maeda. Mitsuyo crossed the Pacific Ocean to plant his martial arts seed in Brazil. Because of it, Carlos Gracie went on to develop his own self-defense system named Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating story that reminds us of the power of immigration. You cross an ocean and brought into the U.S. your experience, your lessons, and every single bit of you. What's the most important quality that you brought from Brazil into the US. It, it's interesting that you, you use martial arts as, a, as a, the beginning of it. Let me tackle that from mix the, the, the beginning of the end of the answer, but through, not through the crossing the ocean, but through the very nature of it. Yeah. Uh, of, the, uh, of martial arts. I think that, that, I mean, as I said, I've been practicing martial arts since I'm, I was, 12 years old. So a long time learning something. I, I've learned two styles of Kung Fu. I've learned boxing. I've learned Muay Thai. I've learned some Judo, a little bit, very little. I've learned a little bit of Capoeira. I've learned um, a lot of Karate. And I'm now learning um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a, when I, it, it was a, 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 an opportunity that I passed on when I started to learn, when I started to fight. And I was, kinda, I was in a Kung Fu school and right underneath, right, kind of the, the lower level, there was a, a, a small Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, kind of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu school. And uh, they, have, they were always inviting us to go there, train with them. And, and I was like, yeah, I can go later. I, let me focus on this. I'll, I'll go there later. And I kept pushing, 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 pushing. And, 35 years later, like I didn't do it. <laughs> and here I am, 47 years old, like looking around, but like, you know what? I've been in this country for such a long time. I, I, I think I'm gonna go back to that because first from a martial arts standpoint, I need to develop a ground game because I feel like there's this hole in my game that I, I, it, I don't take it, I, I don't know. And it's also a way to connect to my roots, my, not only Brazil, but Rio. And although, yeah, as you said, kind of something that came from Japan, it was significantly transformed in, in Brazil. And it's being transformed again in America. The, the, the way that they play, they, they, 
they use jiu-jitsu in America is pretty is, is becoming pretty different from what they do in Brazil. Um, but anyway, I'm I'm learning something new that that celebrates my my roots. And I was I was thinking about this about the influence that martial arts has in 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 my life. And because for me it's hard to dissociate, my life in Brazil has always been very intensively filled with martial arts. So what I brought from Brazil is, is part in part my passion for martial arts because it's a, it's a country, martial arts is a big deal there. Absolutely, there's, yeah. It's not a coincidence that, that, that there's always a Brazilian somewhere in the UFC and these things, it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's part of, it's one of the important sports. It's soccer, when I grew up, there was soccer, then very kind of lower, there was like beach volleyball, and then there were martial arts, different styles of martial arts. And, and jiu-jitsu was a big, a, a big one of in in rising star among them uh and and but i spent my entire life learning some style of martial arts and there's if there's one thing that martial arts teaches you is to hang on when you're being beaten <laughs> is is grit right is that you have the you cannot count as something as a failure based on any given moment because you you know you have to look at that in the long term so you, you look at it goes back to your, the question about the wind right i'll go back to this is how those things connect for me i see people kind of judging themselves and judging others based on a any on a particular moment in short term spurs and i feel like this is not how i grew up thinking you know they they say in, in all martial arts there's a variation of a saying that a black belt is a white belt that didn't give up, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I have multiple black belts. I'm not that talented as a fighter. Mm -hmm. But I started and I went all the way to the black belt. I didn't give up until the black belt in, in, many, different, in, in many different of those little journeys. So because I didn't give up, I, I got to that that kind of big dream of, of, of the black belt. But at any given time, if I took a photo of that journey at any specific moment, it likely felt like a failure. Hmm. Always, because there was always someone better than me taking the best out of me. And, and, and it was only at the very end of, that, of each one, they were like, okay, I think I may be the most senior student here. But there was always someone in another school that was better than me that would beat me. So that that ability to to judge your growth with a broader perspective and the grit to be able to sustain this path of self-improvement through a long period of time not not judging by the day or the week or the month but to the decade or more is actually what i brought with me from from my family my, fa my father was a judoka, was a, a judo black belt. And that's what I brought from my family. That's what I brought from growing up in Rio in a martial arts culture. And then I kept bringing. So I'm not sure that I could tell that this is part of Brazilian culture, but it's definitely part of my experience in Brazil and in Rio. And a very important, probably the most part, important part of my, my upbringing was my, my relationship with martial arts. That it, you can claim, oh, that's very Asian, very Japanese and Chinese. But for me, that's the Brazilian experience. No, I mean, it's, it's great because I, I do think like, you know, as you say, martial arts is so present in Brazil. And it's like, you know, UFC is like, there is always like a great champion, like, you know, in any category, like, you know, martial arts. And I think like martial arts truly really like, you know, give you that kind of resilience, that kind of like, you know, uh, desire to go through uh, the stage of improvement to never quit. And I think like every immigrant, uh, like you, like yourself, like myself, when he first faced the moment when he stepped onto a different soil, he's faced with that kind of challenge. And the moments that you want to quit are so many and they come so fast at you. I mean, they come like bullets. You know, yeah. I remember like, you know, there have been countless moments for me where I say to myself, I I'm going to quit this. I can't do this, you know. But then I think you learn. And 
to me is a metaphor in boxing. You learn how to sleep and punch back. You learn yeah. how to duck. You learn how to like, you know, faint. And, uh, and you all come back to that kind of resilience. So I do think that it's a true, like, you know, Brazilian DNA for you. It's like, and I love it because you truly made one of the best agency in the country. I mean, I mean, everybody talked about like Pereira Odell and like, you know, it's to these days, it, not because you in front of me, but you, that, you guys like push great work and like, uh, and it's admirable, you know, it's like, it's a rare thing and like, you know, to do and it's very hard. So I commend this to you, really. <laughs> For me, it's all, I think in, in the end is, is grit is the thing behind all that because it's, you cannot be, an immigrant without grit. You cannot, you cannot yeah. attain an immigrant without grit. Absolutely and I, no. I would say it's no. hard. I remember kind of when I arrived here my first week on the job, I was, it was at the year that I was president of the jury at Cannes for the first time. So it was like, I was a, a, a big name in the industry that year. It's like, it's like one of the, the three presidents, it was the time that the Cannes only had three presidents. I was one of them. I arrived here and, and someone just looked at me and said, okay, I hear that you're a big deal in Brazil. And I hear that you, you, you got, it became a big, a big name in the world because of your Brazilian visibility. But you just got here in America and it's a whole new game. You're gonna to need to prove yourself all over again. Mm -hmm. And the person said that to, to my face. It's like, holy cow, this is, this is gonna to be tough. <laughs> and I got home like every day with headaches because it's hard to, to hear what people, to understand what people are saying because of the language and I don't hear well from, from oh, what yeah. they said. So it kind of made it even worse. And people kind of, it, it, the entire attitude around me was, uh, let's see if these, these foreigner can, can right. be, if he's, a, if he's good enough to be playing among us. So that kind of, it's, there's, it's, there's an aggressiveness that is really exhausting. And in it, order yeah. to do that, it's, you have to be, you have to have that grit. That is the ability to look at the plan in the long term and sustain and, and hold on for the long term. Is to the boxing analogy is a good one. You can some people when they get punched in the liver, they see that that they feel that pain and their body wants to shut, shut down. down. They want it to 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 lay back and you can consider oh that's a that's a loss. Some people will feel like oh that's not a loss. I'm going to keep fighting and then their body shuts down and they get knocked out oh, that's a loss but no that's not a loss you can fight next tomorrow you can go back to the gym and train again and then you go there and then you spar against some other if you lose and there's a loss no it's not a loss the sequence of losses of constant losses can still be the path for a win absolutely you have the right if you're looking at the the right uh mindset the that's right if you're looking at the right prize and everything and actually Putting yourself at those situations is what creates the, the important wins as well. I was reading about um, these these fighters, this Canadian fighter called Georges St Pierre. He's called one of the yes, the yes. He's supposed. I, I mean, everybody's waiting for him to fight Khabib. I yeah, don't know yeah. if the fight is ever going to happen, but he's he's a legend. He's a true legend. I don't know, but I was I was reading about a, a story that his coach. Uh, it, his um, jiu-jitsu coach, a guy called John Danaher, he was writing about it. It's like, yeah, we all like to, to, to think about our strengths and everything, but if you learn the most, if you go talk about, if you go understand how people like George St. Pierre, that is one of the, this is, it is one of the candidates of the greatest UFC fighters of all time, right? Uh, arguably, he, he may be the, the greatest of all time. And, and, and like when I see him training, I see a guy that can beat any, that can walk into the gym and beat anyone here, right? If he uses his strength, his strength, if he uses his, his striking abilities, if he loses his, um, his athleticism, if he loses, he uses his speed, if he uses his strength, but he walks in here to learn jujitsu with people that are better in jujitsu than him. And instead of doing other things, he puts himself into the worst positions where jiu-jitsu can easily kill him and try to get out of them without using anything other than he's developing jiu-jitsu. So like the, the mindset of, a, of greatness is a mindset of putting yourself in situations of loss as often as you can 
so it can become it can get harder and harder and harder to defeat you but you still put yourself on that 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 again the next time so it's a, it's a big paradox that big long-term victories is built upon small continuous losses not small continuous wins i, lo I love it to love make any sense but that's how it is no but i love the fact i love the analogy of like you know putting yourself in a situation where you could lose and building off those moments and this is true and you know as you're saying like in, in, in mma like you know jujitsu and and so it's like you know in there are countless example in boxing you know uh, that's why I have a huge respect for fighters because their mindset has to be tenacious to a different level. In fact, I always say, you know, there is a two different way of being shaped. There is being shaped and then there is like boxing being shaped. There is being shaped and then there is probably jujitsu being shaped. Two different things. So anyway, great, man. I could talk for hours about this. A loss in fighting hurts. <laughs> <laughs> it does because it causes pain that you cannot avoid you cannot just get distracted no it's gonna hurt <laughs> i know hey look so here's the fifth question in one of the most fascinating clips from wes anderson movie the life aquatic with steve zeus the captain bill murray say let me tell you about my boat now, these seven words start a remarkable presentation of the Belafonte boat. It's a beautiful scene shot by Wes Anderson. If you were to present me your boat, what would be the incipit, the first like words? My boat, I'm gonna steal from, from another boat. My boat would have a pirate ship flag on top, hmm. which is something that I heard that uh, it was started with, with the guys from Chai Day in a long time ago, just coming to the, 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 the bay at Cannes with, with the boat, with the pirate ship, and saying, oh, we're, you're, you're the Navy, oh, we're the pirates. I think it's Chai Day. Yes, um, yes. But it, I, I mean, and I'm not saying that just because they said as I, I I like to see myself as as more of, of a pirate that outsider I don't belong to in, to any any navy I like to to stay nimble to to be able to change and shift and and shift boats and take things from here things from there I I think that the 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 way I describe the agency and describe the culture of the agency and the vision of the agency is is this little sentence that we put in the, we put in the first slide, the first presentation since our first day, that is, if advertising were being invented right now, how would we do this? Right. Right? And I think that, that for me, the definition of the agency is not an answer, is that question or, of my agency. And for me, that allows me to keep that pirate mentality no matter what, because there's always someone who's going to come up with an amazing ship, and I'll feel, all right, I'm, I'm going to take that ship, and I'll just go there, and, and take the ship for, for me and then combine things from this ship and that ship and keep changing things and making my, my experience, my nautical experience become whatever it needs to be and, and keep changing so I don't get bored and I, I don't get, I, I can't predict what's gonna happen tomorrow. You know, like uh, I, I was like, uh, I was a former, like I'm a former like Chai Day guy. So the pirate thing like, you know, really like got to me but if I were to describe my boat, probably like, you know, I come from more like from punk. To me, when people like call you punk, it's like, I remember like uh, the founder of like, like Sex Pistols once say, the manager of Sex Pistols once say, to be a punk means to enter doors that you weren't supposed to enter and to kick down walls that you weren't supposed to kick down. So my boat would probably have Sid Vicious singing like, I did it my way, like, you know, <laughs> and then it's up on the back of the boat, uh, smoking some weeds. But um, I think like the punk and the pirates and to be an outsider, it's a great feeling. I, I, I personally think that keeps you on the edge. It keeps you alive, keeps you moving. It's yeah, the but underdog but feeling. But for me, it's, it's, a, it's a notion that 
whatever's the boat that I'm today is not likely going to be the boat that I'm going to have a year from now. <laughs> you know, that is, this boat is a temporary space. Right. So it's, that's what I think is like, yeah, I will take my flag. If there's a boat that I like better, I'll take that boat and put my flag on that boat. And that's my boat now. And if there's other two boats that I want to take and combine to a third boat, I'll, I'll keep doing that. I have no commitment to, to any state of boatness. That's a true pirate's attitude, my man. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'm fine. Good. I see the shore. Ah, okay, this question. When the seagulls follow the trawler, is because they think sardines will be thrown in the sea. Now, mm -hmm. these were the immortal lines used read by Eric Cantona, a great fucking crazy soccer player during a press interview. It was a sarcastic way to condemn the media for always following the trend rather than thinking with their own minds. Now, our creative industries comes with a very similar mentality. It seems that quite often we follow the trend rather than think with our own mind. My question for you is, what trend would you rather not follow? I don't, I don't, I don't like to feel like I'm following any trend whatsoever. I mean, the, I think there are two ways of, of being successful in the long term in this business. And I'll try to talk without contempt for the side that I, where I don't belong. But if you think practically, there are two ways of doing it. You can either go for best practices. So you see what has been working and you just make it, you optimize it, make it work more reliably, right? And there are agencies that do that very well. And so those are places that make very few mistakes, but they take very, and because they take very little risk, so they're very reliable. And, and that's fine. I, I respect that. There are other, other players that go the other way. They go very good on taking the, what looks like a crazier risk, what hasn't been done before, and understanding what those risks are and minimizing them so things can be reliable through, you know, but still regardless of the innovation aspect of it, right? The problem is that in the middle of it, you have the majority of the industry wanting to be risk takers being forced to be reliable so they are not they're not reliable enough to understand how to make things operate like a machine and they don't know how to take risks and mitigate those risks to to make sure that they are going to land on on the right results so all they become is like this mush of things that try to see with the like these like crazy eyed person that tried to see, oh, my clients are expecting reliability. So I'm, I'm going to talk like this, but I want to be one of those pirates, one of those crazy ones there. So I'm going to try to do something crazy every now and then. And those, those things don't, do not match. There's a way to be really good on both, both sides. And the middle is what sucks. But the middle is where everyone, most at least, are, right? So if you ask me about trends, trends is the forefront of the, the best practice, right? Is that like, oh, this is the, the things that are, have been done not too much, but enough for us to try to understand what works. Is the pioneer of best practices. That's what a trend is. If you're on the, the innovator side, you're not, you're not looking for the trend. You're looking for the things that will become a trend. If it can be identified as a trend, it doesn't belong there. I like to, to play on this side. I mean, I, it's a question that every time in, in, in a big jury, there's one journalist that comes to me and says, what is the trend that you, you want to see in this festival? Like, I don't want to see anything. I'm going to try to, to kill anything that I can track as a trend. And in fact, that's exactly how it works, right? One thing wins 
a lot of awards. If you can identify one trade that wins a lot of awards in one year, the next year you're gonna see a barrage of, of entries that follow exactly that. And then Absolutely. only yeah. a few of them are really going to stand out despite of the fact that they, they did that. What people don't see that inside of the jury room, we are looking at another one that does that, another one that plays that trick, another one that plays that trick, and it starts to kill them all. And for every, when you see the winners, oh, there's, there, that's still winning. What you don't see is that 90% of the things that try to follow that trend died along the way for the simple reason that we could identify they were trying to do. And yeah, no, I agree with that. Stuff, trends don't work in advertising. Absolutely. But absolutely, they don't work. And what I found like very annoying, like, you know, that sometimes as creative industry, we shouldn't pick up on those trends. Like, you know, I can't pinpoint the moment where, I don't know, you remember American Beauty, the, 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 the shopping bag scene. After that came out, man, every single a uh, person was trying to redo that scene. Inception, the explosion scene at the bar. That came out, everybody wanted to do a slow motion, of, like, you know, and then Gorilla with like, you know, Cadbury. I mean, God, man, there is like so many countless attempts to steal and mock like other people created creativity. And I think like you're right, like, you know, let's kill the trend. And let's go for what really like seems to be like you know the only way, which is like innovate is such a great word, but somehow advertising made it into like a buzzword. Uh, so I think that's the only way is through really, like to ignore the trend and carve your own path as much as a cliche can be, but that's the only way we can survive. Last question, and right. it's the question that we ask all our quests. A guest. So, if there is a if there is a wind that blow your sail, and you were to name this wind, what would the name be? Avanti. Oh man, this is an Italian word. This is for all my Italian friends. Avanti. Oh man, that's beautiful. I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, okay, a, a, we have that. It, we have that word in Portuguese as well. So for me, is is that yeah? It's forward. It's like. There's, in in you 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 have to keep moving. There's you know, everyone makes mistake. Everyone has problems in the past. But if you just keep moving forward, don't 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 get too bogged down by the things that have come, the good and the bad ones in the past. You just kind of focus forward and you just keep going. You keep your momentum. Momentum is 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 a function of of keeping your your movement on, on on moving or changing the direction of the move of the movement without slowing it down right and and i think that that's that's what it what it is Just don't don't lose momentum ever see uh -huh. if you've ever seen a capoeira person play that's momentum that's how they they never stop because you're always sure. and keep that thing that's one for me that is a bunty it's like you have a win just go with it and keep going I mean, I wish you all the, the best and like all the Avanti <laughs> that you can have. Like, thank you so much for taking the time to be on Transatlantic and for offering me to go across your ocean. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> bye, man. Bye.